Welcome to the Nutritious and Delicious podcast with me, Bethany. Our mission is to support busy parents all over the world to learn time management while taking care of your nutritional, physical, and mental health. After all, a healthy family starts with a healthy parent. So I'm super excited today. I have Deborah Jacobs here with me, and Deborah is a money coach who helps people overcome shame, fear, and overwhelm around money to take action to master their finances and achieve their goals. A single mom by choice with two daughters who are now young adults, Deborah focused on many years um, with two things, her kids and the preschool sorry, she founded and operated. She never paid much attention to money and it all caught up with her debt, money, anxiety, and lack of a clear path to her future. So welcome, Deborah. I'm super grateful to have you here today on the Nutritious and Delicious podcast. Thank you so much, Bethany. I'm so excited to be here. Excellent. So I'm really thrilled to have this conversation today because this, I find, is a big one for women in particular. And our episode today is about financial savvy moms. So kind of wanting to know from your perspective, being a money coach, um, what have you found in your experience with women and how they've been talking about money, issues that are coming up for them, and what stories you're hearing from other women around you? Yeah, well, I, I'm hopeful that things are changing. Um, and I definitely don't want to make generalizations based on a person's generation. But some of my older clients who may be in the process of getting divorced or have been divorced or find themselves in a situation now where they're the ones who really need to manage the money, there is so much really terror around mm-hmm. money. Um, especially if somebody hasn't dealt with it before and now they're responsible for the family's finances. So we work a lot with that. Um, I, I see with younger women that many are more cognizant of what they need to do to take care of themselves and financially and in, in other ways. But really, for many, many people, younger or older, those three words that you said in the introduction show up, which mm-hmm. is fear, shame, and overwhelm around money. And you know, we're not we're not taught about money, many of us. It's not something usually personal finance isn't something taught in most schools. Our parents often are socialized not to talk about money. And so we grow up thinking we're going to become adults and all of a sudden know how to do this. Mm-hmm. And many people, okay. I, I didn't, you know, many, many people don't. And so there are all these feelings around that about, you know, oh my gosh, um, this is terrifying. Do you find like, just when you're talking about sort of um, the younger generation versus sort of, the, I guess, the older generation, do you think that there's a lot of trauma around money and watching a parent maybe struggle or become um, financially dependent and then, you know, have the rug pulled out from underneath them. And do you think the younger generations are kind of looking to that? Well, I need to make sure that that doesn't happen to me. Yeah, absolutely. And that can work for good or not so good. I mean, we all carry around stories from our childhood. I know you talk a lot about the tapes that Mm -hmm. play in our heads. And if we grew up in a family where money was scarce, and there was tension about money. Uh, money's the number one cause of divorce. So maybe there were fights about money. Um, and if there's some trauma around finances, people grow up, you know, terrified sometimes of spending money or, yeah. or um, a- afraid of uh, that, that there's never enough. They don't live in a sense of abundance right. uh, because of that. So I think some of those stories definitely do carry over. And the work is not only to learn the ABCs of money, you know, of how to manage money, but it's really also to look at what are those stories that we tell ourselves about money that may be holding us back from achieving the kind of life we want to live financially and otherwise. It sounds like there's a lot of tapes, I think, for people where um, maybe they've grown up around money, where like money is greed or money is dirty. Like obviously, because, you know, as a kid, the first things I think you were taught is that we're if we hold cash change in our hands and then we put it on our our mouth as children, it's like, put that down, that's dirty. And it's this notion that money is dirty 
um, that you maybe don't deserve it or things like that. And I think as people grow older, it's almost like they either try to hoard it or get rid of it somehow. And maybe that comes out in like shopping sprees or yeah. hoarding money and not spending it on certain things. And yeah. I find a lot of people too with money, it's um, priorities and values. Like how does that sort of mix? Like, do you notice like a difference with um, different generations of like values of maybe spending more money on children? Like we, we talk with a lot of moms. So I've noticed personally a lot of moms and myself included, we're more likely to spend on our children than we are on ourselves. Right. I mean, I think that's true of many people of any generation is that we want um, we want good things for our children. Mm -hmm. We want to spend our money on our children and that's uh, often a priority. One of the first things that I do with clients before we even get into the nitty gritty of their numbers is spend a session working on values. Mm -hmm. And there's no judgment attached to this. You know, if you value fancy cars, that's perfectly fine. Let's figure out how to get you in a fancy car and yeah. keep you there and still have a roof over your head and food on the table and be doing uh, things that work for your finances. If you don't value that, you value other things. You value raising your children a certain way. You value maybe traveling with your children, mm -hmm. traveling with your family. Whatever your values are, we work around um, figuring out the finances. It's very values based. Mm -hmm. So I don't think I really see a generational difference in that, but I do see a lot of people who aren't really living financially according to their values. Right. And one of the reasons for that is that we tell ourselves that we're busy. You know, right. life is busy. We're moms. We're taking care of our children. Many of us are working and we're balancing family life, balancing mm -hmm. work. Even if uh, we're a stay at home mom, we know how difficult of a job that is. And there's just you know, a lot going on. And so it's one more thing like, oh, mm -hmm. I don't want to do that. And then ignoring causes so many problems. Yeah, you know, I've noticed that one too with, with moms. Yeah. I, I've came, like, I've come across quite a few moms where I've heard them say, like, my husband deals with, or my partner deals with all the finances. So it would be really handy, I think, today for you to be able to share some solutions to help women feel more financially set up for their future. Um, and this is where I think a lot of partners, you know, they're having issues where they don't feel like they have control over their finances or their own personal finances, and maybe they haven't learned that. Um, yeah. You know, myself included, I, you know, when I first started, I had a mortgage on my own at 21. So I understood a lot about, you know, paying bills and a mortgage at a really young age and being quite responsible. And I already was a very responsible kid, teenager. Um, and that helped me, I think, on my journey, because obviously um, later on, I was very financially dependent upon my spouse who then passed away. But I actually learned prior to that the skills around money and understanding like bills and stuff. But there's a lot of women I've noticed I've run into where they've maybe left home, they've gone straight into a marriage or a relationship, um, or like they haven't really learned how to sort of take care of themselves. And they're sort of like, well, I don't want to deal with it. So I'll just pass it on to my partner. And then they're kind of hooped later down the road. Yeah. So it's so easy to do. If it's something you don't really want to deal with, and you have a partner who will deal with it, it's really easy to just say, you deal with it, yeah. I'll deal with other things. And of course you experienced a big tragedy and I mm -hmm. don't ever wanna say you were lucky, but in one respect, you were lucky in that you had that prior experience of being mm -hmm. independent, owning a home on your own, being on your own so that you had, that when your, your husband passed as awful as that experience was, you had that um, that knowledge, you had yeah. that ability to be able to go forward with your finances. Right. So many people don't. I know. And I do work with a lot of women who find themselves so unexpectedly yeah. in a situation of divorce or possibly widowhood. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, we think we get married, we think this is forever. And hopefully it is. And for many people it is and it's a wonderful partnership. But, you know, 
a lot of people end up divorced and yeah. life happens. And so there are some steps that any woman should take, even if your husband is the one who pays the bills and does the most managing of the money. There are just certain things that you absolutely should do. So what are those three things, I guess, that you can okay. give us some tips on here? Sure. One of them is know how much money you have and where it is. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if you have no idea how much money you and or your husband have invested, where it's invested, what bank accounts it's in, you need to sit down with your partner and say, look, you could get hit by a bus tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And if that happens, I'm, I'm up the creek. I wouldn't know where to start. So I'm really grateful that you deal with this, but I need some basic information. I need to know yeah. what we have, where it is and what the passwords are. That was a big one I noticed for myself. So like when you do, you know, when you're in something where the rug is pulled out from underneath you, as much as you can be savvy with things, if you haven't got passwords or know where certain accounts are or the people that you're supposed to be dealing with in terms of these accounts, like this is, it's it's a goose chase, right? And you're, you're in a nightmare. Yeah. If you don't have those passwords. Yeah. I mean, that's that's really hard. Yeah. And the other thing is you need to know what's in your name and what's in your husband's name. That is a big one. Yeah. Yeah. Because there are women who get into a situation where they're looking at divorce or, you know, they have a tragedy and all of a sudden they're widows mm -hmm. and they had no idea that the house wasn't in their name or that, you know, um, there are credit cards that are in their name that he has racked up a lot of debt on. And right. now, you know, you're responsible for paying off all that debt yeah. and your credit tanks because of, of that. So you really need to know what your name is on, what your name is not on, and, um, and sit down and figure out why. Like right. sometimes there are good reasons, but why is my name not on the deed? Let's figure that out. And why, you know, um, you, you need to know what and why. Yeah, it's kind of more of like an assurance, I think, because yeah. again, when you said in the beginning, um, we're not trying to be sort of pessimistic on this, but like, you know, if it's not always, you know, white picket fence, and if something does happen along those lines, God forbid, myself included, I didn't expect any of this to happen, but it did. And um, you need to have these things in place where if you don't know where things are or your names are on certain things, like luckily, a lot of things for myself was under business names, things like that. So I was excluded from things when obviously someone passes, like even cars or trucks, they can be repossessed because they're not being yeah. paid. Right. And Absolutely. it's not out of fault of that person not paying off their stuff. But sometimes just like I said, things happen. And um, if they are a depreciating value, like they're either going to be collected and or they're in your name and you have to pay it. Right. Right. The other thing you want to know is on all of your accounts, who's the beneficiary? Mm -hmm. And that means who gets the money if you die? Right. So I was working with a woman the other day. She's been divorced a couple of years. We were looking at her accounts and lo and behold, her ex-husband is still the beneficiary <laughs> on an investment account that, that has a lot of money in it. Yeah. And so if she were to die tomorrow, that money would not go to her child who right. she wants the money to go to. The money would go to her ex-husband. Yeah, with that's whom a... she has a very <laughs> acrimonious relationship. <laughs> so, um, you know, you really yeah. want to know who are the beneficiaries as well. So right. you want information. Now, if you are in an abusive relationship, this yeah. can be very difficult. And I would suggest that you start just whenever you have the opportunity, when your spouse or your partner is not around, um, to start figuring this out in ways that he's not going to be able to trace. Right. You know, taking screenshots and sending it to a friend and taking it off of your phone. Mm -hmm. um, that sort of thing. 
it's it's sad but the reality is true there are a lot of relationships out there where money is used as a form of control or yes. there are you know abusive relationships going on where you know men or women you know don't feel like they can get out and um that's where i think having a cash flow or somewhere safe in a safe maybe not at your house but somewhere else that you can entrust maybe parents or other relatives that you can trust because it's kind of a bit of an escape fund, unfortunately. Yes, and that's another thing that I would recommend is that you put aside some money that's your own. I think it's a it's a good yeah. idea if you have parents you trust, put it in their name. You mm -hmm. know, as long as you totally trust them, and that if the situation arises, right, you know, you can have access to that. You may end up in a situation where you need first month's rent, last month's rent, and security deposit. Right. And you may not even have access to that. So if you can put aside some cash or put aside some money just of your own. Now, in many states in the United States, and I'm not sure about Canada or other places, they're called community property states. And so okay. whether the money's in your name or your husband's name, it doesn't matter. Things are just split down the middle okay. generally. Um, but, and I'm not, encouraging anybody to do anything illegal like you know hiding money or whatever but have some cash you mm -hmm. know have have some open a savings deposit box and just every once in a while stash some cash in there have I, something of yeah. your own that you can fall back on i think it's good because it gives it gives you a sense of independence as well and that um you know, whether you're in a in an abusive relationship or not, I think it's important to have something, even if it's for like, you wanna buy gifts for somebody like your spouse yeah. and you don't want them to right. see on the credit right. card what you bought for them. You know what I mean? Like it's always right. good to have at least either a credit card or a debit savings card or something along those lines where if you do want to actually buy something for yourself, you don't have to feel, you know, so guilty. And I think that's where a lot of moms go is that, well, my husband makes the money, therefore he gets to spend the money, therefore only the kids get the money, and basically I'm chopped liver, you know? That's right, that's right. And I would like to tell all of you who are listening, you are not chopped liver. No. So you are doing super important work. Mm -hmm. You know, there as a, as a preschool owner for 18 years, I can tell you, and as a mom, there is nothing more important than raising children. Yeah. And it's there's nothing harder than raising children. It's one of the it's hardest hard jobs work. I've ever had. Yes. <laughs> it's incredibly difficult, yeah. joyous, wonderful, but very difficult. And you are doing valuable work. Right. And so that's another thing that comes up as a point of contention for a lot of couples, which is, let's say you're a stay at home mom and your husband is making all of the money in the family. Mm -hmm. There can be a real power imbalance. Right. And you need to step into the power of the job that you're doing. You know, yeah. you are doing super important work and really, you know, make sure that finances are evenly divided. Um, and that can be difficult and that can mean a lot of conversations with your husband and it can even mean counseling with a good financial coach who specializes in working with mm -hmm. couples. I know a couple of people who do that and they're fabulous. Mm -hmm. um, so, so that could be, you know, um, something just to think about. If you are in that situation, is the the power imbalance affecting your feelings around money and your actions around money? I could imagine that it leads to a lot of resentment and anger in the relationship. On both sides. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, so yeah, for sure. It becomes now, quite a power thing, struggle, right? Yeah. The other thing to think about is to start taking some really simple steps, whether for your whole family or just for yourself, to think about whatever money comes in. So most people, what they do is money comes in and they figure they pay all their bills, they figure out what they need for groceries, what they need for the other necessities of life, maybe for you know a dinner out or something like that. And then whatever's left over, if there's anything left over, I'll save that. 
And that is actually backwards. Mm -hmm. That can lead to many years of very little savings and investment. Mm -hmm. And if you just flip that and you say any money that comes in, I'm going to take a certain percentage before I do anything else and I'm going to put it away. It's almost it's almost it. like when people have a paycheck, like they if they have something on there or like a union or RSP, like it takes off automatically and you're kind of like, right. I don't even recognize that it's gone. That's right. And so anytime money comes, hits your account, automatically a certain percentage should go mm -hmm. into a savings account. When that savings hits a certain amount of money, it gets invested in however you want to invest. That's a conversation for a whole other time. But you need to start growing that muscle of saving money and investing money. Mm -hmm. um, it seems so daunting. I mean, for so many years, I was running my preschool and I was raising my kids. And I kept telling myself, I, I can't learn about investing. It's too much. I can't think about it. I, you know, I, I just later, 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 I'll get to it later. Mm -hmm. And boy, if I had just done really tiny little things like paid myself first and put it into in in the United States an IRA with you know an index fund say mm -hmm. something super simple that I don't even have to think about and just mm -hmm. put money in boy I'd be in a much better position today and I want that for you you know I want yeah. that for everybody who's listening is to is to start thinking about your future and putting some money away for that Investing is huge. Um, personally, myself, I've been kind of on that path for the last year and a bit. And I think at first, when you when you sort of look at investing, you think, oh, you know, I'll do it later. <clears throat> like it's it's something for men or whatever. Like it's just these tapes yeah. I think that you have in your head. And I just started with YouTube videos, and I just started listening and then reading articles and doing yeah. my own research. Like I do a lot of research on things before I make a decision. Yes, so I knew I knew I wouldn't jump in. Um, yeah. But I think it's it takes time and just little by little um, you start to gain momentum in, a, um, in what you're learning and right. you start to understand it and you're like, okay, like I'm ready to put both feet in and do this. Obviously, you know, don't put it into something like 100% like all eggs in one basket. Right. Don't do things like that, obviously. But just little by little, like this is where yeah. you can actually grow your money while you're sleeping. And right. um, it, it's another form of income for people. Right. And I would suggest a book mm -hmm. called The Simple Path to Wealth. It's by a person named J.L. Collins. Really easy read. He wrote it as a letter to his adult daughter, young mm -hmm. adult daughter who was just learning about money. Mm -hmm. And I think it's, it, you know, if you're going to start to even think about investing, this is a really good place to start. It's a very easy read. Right. And um, so it's called A Simple Path to Wealth. So I highly recommend that. I love that. Yeah. So do you have any kind of last final words, I guess, for these moms out there that are sort of maybe don't have a bank account, sort of a, relying on maybe their partner to do a lot of this sort of stuff for, yeah. for them, I guess? Open something in your own name just to have that experience. Open a bank account or open a credit card just in your name and build your own credit yeah. so that your credit, your credit is going to be tied to your spouse because you are going to have joint things. Most couples do. Right. But it's also good to have a credit card, pay it off in full every month before the due date. Mm -hmm. Don't ever let it get late. Yeah. And don't, don't keep a balance on it because mm -hmm. the interest on credit cards is crazy. But have a credit card in your own name to start building your own credit. And then one other thing that I would say, particularly for stay-at-home moms, is I know you're doing exhausting work. Mm -hmm. I get it. But at the same time, you might want to think about carving out eight hours a week, mm -hmm. some small amount of time to start doing something that's income producing. Right. Doesn't matter what it is. If it's 
bringing children into the house and taking care of other children, that could be fine. If it's starting a little business, if you're a crafter and you, you know, sell crafts, it could be that. It could be a part-time job. Whatever it is, start doing something income producing so that if you do find yourself in a situation where you have to be income producing, you won't have this gap and you will have experience of speaking with people in a way that, you know, you have to, I hate using the word sell yourself or sell mm -hmm. something, but you have to have, speak with confidence when right. you're, when you're doing something that you learn how to do that. So do something that's there, income producing. There's so many things out there for moms. I think what I struggled with is I didn't want to leave the house. And I think yes. with everything going on right now, there's way more remote work than yes, you, you could imagine. And yeah. even along the lines of like a lot of moms have turned into bloggers, yep. um, like, you know, social media consult yep. consultants and things like that. Um, the other one too is reviewers, like reviewing kid products or yeah. um, other women's products. So there's a lot yeah. of different things you can do from home that you don't have to leave your house. You right. can still be around your children and think about, I know this, this is what's gonna come up for a lot of women. Well, I don't have the time to do it. Well, I can attest to this because I'm, you know, I've been a single parent, I've been running a business and been with my kids and doing everything. And I still had time to look at investing and I still had time to um, work and do these things. It's just that my priorities are different. Um, I woke up earlier to get these things done. And when you think about how much time you spend on social media or watching TV, that's the time that you should be doing these things. So true. Listen, I had a lot of excuses for a lot of years. Yeah. And that's exactly what they were excuses. And again, I get it. You know, I understand you're exhausted. Yeah. I it's get really it. hard work. But if you commit to it, you can find the time. You exactly. know, you can you can find a little bit of a week, a little right. bit of each week to work on something that moves you towards the future. That's awesome. Well, I appreciate so much. Thank you, Deborah, for that. So how can our viewers today connect with you and learn more about these money tips with you? Yeah, I'd love to connect with your viewers. Uh, the best way is through my website, which is moneysmartforlife.com. And uh, that will tell you all about financial coaching and what I do. And there's a contact form there. Um, also, people can listen to my podcast, which is Finance Your Dream. And you can search for it and find it on, you know, pretty much wherever you listen to podcasts. Excellent. I'll put those in the show notes for everybody as well so they can click on the links easily. So once again, it's been a pleasure having you, Deborah. I'm super excited that you've been on the Nutritious and Delicious show. This is probably one of the first topics I've actually talked about money, um, but it's it's crucial. I think like when I think about it, there's a lot of women that are in what I would say sort of tight situations, um, not being able to leave situations because of this. And um, it's good to listen to other women that have been through it and have the experience. And I'm extremely grateful that you came onto the show. So thank you. Thank you. And I would like to say one last thing. And that is that I think everything in life is related. So until you take care of your money part of your life and your personal finances it's difficult to move forward with other parts of your life and vice versa mm -hmm. so it's it's a really important piece that many people just push to the side but it's really a crucial piece of living your dream life and moving Perfect. forward so wonderful. in any event thank you so much bethany it's been a pleasure speaking with you wonderful thank you so much deborah